get to go forward. And remember that these stage lights are on. How are you going to appear in front of the jury? Uh, we have to keep this in mind, right? We have different types of objections. You have people that are, that are jumping up all the time. We have people that object in a way that's just rude. Um, and the jury senses that, right? If I'm not going to let someone even finish their question, objection! And I don't have, you know, the jury is perceiving that. The jury's looking at that. The jury's judging you based on the way you do that. How do you want to come off in this trial? Should carry through to the way you object, the way you respond, the way you deal with the court when your objection is overruled, when you don't get the ruling or the answer that you want, how do you proceed and carry on as if it's exactly as you intended, as if that's how you knew it was going to happen. I'm going to talk about this in terms of three different columns, three different stages. Evidentiary sensors, objections, and then the responses. And this, uh, this goes along with the handout that we've given you. Uh, I want you to think about it in terms of this way. The opponent the one who is uh, not asking the questions at the time, the one who's not presenting evidence at the time, the opponent, the one who's probably sitting down, just listening to the proponent put something on, has sort of two stages to this. The first I call evidentiary sensors. It's your preparation as an opponent to know where your opposing side is going. Where is the proponent going with these questions? Where are they going by putting in this exhibit? What is this whole presentation about? And knowing where they're going, you can know what objections might come up. But this is the trial strategy. This is the planning that goes on. The next one for the opponent is the objection. Then for the proponent, the one asking the questions, the one putting on the evidence, the one putting in an exhibit, then must respond. And we're going to talk about that. Lastly, of course, uh, you don't offer up everything as the opponent objecting. We teach that when you object, it's a word, the word objection and then the basis. Objection calls for hearsay. Objection irrelevant. Objection, improper character. I certainly have more to say under the rules about that objection, but recognize that you're alerting the court, there might be a response from the proponent, and then it's your turn if you're at sidebar or, may sidebar or maybe in front of the court and in front of the jury that you will offer up the longer explanation as to why your objection should be sustained. Let's talk first about these evidentiary sensors. The idea is where are these things going to come from? How do I build these things? You do not start law school knowing how to object and when to object. That's something that develops. And in the litigation center, we hope that it develops through your time in our courses, through mock trial, through your externships, through everywhere else. You start to hear and listen for and key into what's going to be objectionable at trial. But I want you to start thinking about these evidentiary sensors that happen way before you sit down at a counsel table at trial. It comes from these different places. It comes from discovery, disclosures. It comes from witness lists and exhibit lists. It comes from pretrial statements. It comes from court filings. You've learned a lot about this case before you ever make your way into trial. All of that contributes to the what is the other side looking to do? Where are they going? And once you understand what they're trying to do or where they are going, you can start to appreciate where they may misstep or where they're pushing the boundaries or where they're doing something that's potentially objectionable. The last thing that we think less about is that sometimes it comes down to asking. If you're going to go into trial, I hope that you've communicated with opposing counsel a bunch. I hope you've written letters. I hope you've had discussions with opposing counsel saying, you're not going to put on that witness, uh, the one character witness, are you? You're not going to put in that document that you sent over to us in discovery. And you either get an answer or you don't, but then that fuels your education about what's going on at trial. That decides whether you're going to have to do something about it or not. The other thing is, and this is when I, I think it's truly applicable that we call it a sensor, is that you have to be paying attention and listening at trial. When your opposing counsel, the proponent of the questions, the proponent of the evidence at trial, is up doing their thing, you should be listening. You should be listening with pen in hand and a notepad out, or maybe your laptop up if you're able to do that. But you should be listening. You shouldn't be working on your next part you shouldn't be rearranging the questions in your cross-examination. You should be listening to what they're doing. Because questions will come up, evidence will be put forth, or responses are going to come out of witness's mouth that should trigger with you. And again, it, it might not be all of them right now, but you should be working on what am I listening for? That's what that handout's about. What am I listening for? What's going to come out of my opposing counsel's mouth? What's going to come out of this witness's mouth that's going to cause me to get up, which is going to cause me to stop the presses with an objection. All right, so my senses went off. How do I plan it? 
It depends on where, right? What do I do? It depends on where in the trial. You should think about, as a matter of trial strategy, if it's important enough, if it's a big deal enough, if it's really important and you know they're going to do something that you need to stop, that's, that's the signal for a motion to eliminate. That's the time when you put, uh, take your laptop out and you actually write up a motion and you write up something where you're going to have a hearing ahead of trial and you're going to have a decision ahead of trial. The next sort of grade of serious treatment is if that comes up at trial, it's objection basis, objection, calls for hearsay, request for an immediate sidebar. That is, I need to say more right now. I need to get over to a place outside of the ear of the jury and say more right now. And we need to cover it right now, what my, uh, my important problem with this evidence or with this question or with this exhibit is. The last one, you may, uh, your senses may go off because you hear something for the first time at trial, but you may, through discovery, through pretrial statements, uh, through these other pretrial mechanisms, you may say, oh, they plan to call this witness. They plan to elicit this statement. They plan to put in this exhibit um, but I'm willing, as a matter of strategy, to let it play out at trial, to see the context that it comes up. I'm willing to sort of handle that on my feet at trial. What I want you to appreciate with this continuum is motions in limine over here, objection basis, I need to have the fuller explanation at sidebar right now, and then an objection that I handle right in front of the jury that that's the way that path goes. This gives the most attention to the judge. The motion in limine gets the most attention from the judge. You're more likely to get a truer ruling on the evidence because you put it in writing, you had a hearing, you had an argument. The sidebar is probably next because at least you've got everything out of your mouth. It wasn't just objection basis. You've got the whole explanation of what's problematic so the judge has more and more information by which to make their decision. The least likely, objection hearsay. You're, re you're, you're relying on a judge to recognize what that objection is, what it's about, and maybe even the response and counter if we're not going to entertain those arguments in front of a jury. So you, as a matter of strategy, have to decide, do I take the full board version, do I take the middle road, or do I handle it at trial in front of a jury? And these things are a matter of strategy when your sensors go off. I talked about objections at trial, and that's what we're talking about now. We're talking about objections. Now I want you to think about objections as um, there's two popular ways that new lawyers and law students think of objections that I want you to recast this in your brain a little bit. A lot of us think about it as this is, this is sort of the me against them approach. How do I prove that I'm better at trial advocacy than my opponent? Objections. I'm going to give them a hard time with objections and I'm going to put a stick in the spoke right, and hopefully trip them up as I go through objections. Right? I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to use objections as a way to get at them and get under their skin. Again. Be cognizant of the fact that a jury is watching. If you are ringing in the buzzer and objecting to every other question, you run an equal risk that all of a sudden your opponent is what? Sympathetic. You're giving them a hard time. Wow, they just want the answer from the witness. What's so problematic about these answers that he has to stand up all the time? You have to, have to be cognizant of that audience, that members of the public watching you do your job as it relates to objections. The room has to be with you in a lot of ways. Even if something is potentially objectionable, if I've already ticked them off through trial and there's eye rolls going on in the jury, I may sit on my hands for the next one. I may weigh that against the, what's the potential damage of this evidence coming out versus are they really forming opinions about me and my practice of objecting too much. The second one, the second approach, is that we think it's a game, that we think it's jeopardy and that we're gonna ring in. Uh, I said it's an opportunity to show them that you know. It's an opportunity to show them how much you know the rules of evidence, but it is not a, a $100,000 quiz show, okay? It's not one of those things where the jury's gonna go back into deliberations and they're gonna say, well, I don't know what went on in this trial or who's right or who's wrong or, or even how we should rule, but wow, was Porter terrific. I mean, he, he seemed like he rung in on almost every answer and I imagine that he'd be well in the lead as we went into Final Jeopardy, right? That's not the way they're looking at it. It's not the way they consider it. And so you too should lose the idea that uh, you're gonna prove how much you know by how many times you ring in and getting answers right. Nobody wants the know-it-all and nobody wants that type of person in trial either. So just be cognizant of these two approaches. Objections are to control what evidence comes before a jury. Don't, it's not more, it's not less. So object when you're protecting the jury and protecting their heirs from potential.